Hey everyone, I'm Tyler Putman with the Museum of the American Revolution back with another one of our artisan field trips. And today I'm really excited that we're going to Maryland to join Ben Barges. Ben has been a regular at a lot of our events. You might have seen Ben at Occupied Philadelphia or our History After Hours program. Uh, and Ben, it's so great to be joining you in your workshop. Could you uh, maybe introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got involved in living history, but also this branch of living history we've been exploring that includes making and reproducing things? Sure. So my name is Ben Barges, and I am a conservator technician. Uh, I've worked in conservation for the last 12 years, and I got interested in living history when I was a kid. I always loved playing dress up, and I never had the opportunity to actually do that until, like a lot of people, I went to college. I was able to join a living history group, and I loved every minute of it. Um, when I started uh, my first internship in conservation in 2008, that uh, tied in really well for me, the hands-on part of it, um, with uh, what I was already doing in living history with working very hands-on. And so one of the things I found um, at, for my first internship, I was working with a collection of 18th century ledger bindings in the collection of the Maryland State Archives. And I was instantly very interested, not only in the, the modern conservation treatment of these volumes, but also in how the materials were made originally and who was making them, why were they being used? Um, and so I, those are the questions that I started to ask myself over the course of my conservation career. Um, in 2012, I was able to get a scholarship to Rare Book School at the University of Virginia, where I took a course on history of European and American papermaking that included learning how to make 18th century style paper. Um, I learned about ink making um, because when you're working with treating 18th century inks, it helps to learn the, uh, the chemical background behind how they're working and how people were making them. And when I started getting interested in early 19th century reenacting in 2010 and then 18th century reenacting in 2015, um, when I started coming to living history events uh, and looking around for you know, the things that I wanted to bring to my persona, which would be the things that I work with, you know, in my professional life, paper, uh, ink, pens. Um, I looked around on the market and realized that some of the products that I was really interested in having weren't commercially available. No one was making them or no one was making them to um, high enough accuracy standards. Um, one of the things is that, you know, um, a military historian will be able to see from like a hundred yards off that someone is carrying a Charleville musket when they should be carrying a brown vest. And for me, you know, I can look from very far away and see that someone is using a 19th century reproduction marble paper when they should be using an 18th century pattern. Um, and uh, when I realized that these materials just, you know, weren't on the market, I realized, you know, I'm going to have to make them myself. And so that got me down the rabbit hole of starting to make my own inks and ink powder, make my own wafer seals. Um, I haven't gotten to the point of making my own paper, but a lot of the papers that I purchase are handmade. Um, and just, you know, working to try and find all of the different materials that will really give um, the sense of realness that you get from working with original materials um, and also being able to, and learning about the context of them. That's always been the thing that's really interested me is not just the objects, but the context of their use um, and making sure that I understand why you would use one thing instead of another. And that goes uh, really hand in hand when you're trying to figure out how to reproduce something is understanding the choices that you're making in a reproduction. I think it's so cool to think about the depth of detail and attention that you bring to this work. You know, we, we're in the midst of uh, an exhibition, When Women Lost the Vote, which is features some really amazing documents and bound books, uh, you know, the writings of Abigail Adams, the original New Jersey state constitutions, but I actually had never thought about, you know, what's the paper made of, what's the ink made of, what did that letter from Abigail to John look like when it was folded and sealed and mailed to Philadelphia? Um, so I actually have a lot of questions about stationer's work and stationery, um, but I know one of our projects today involves kind of a multi-part demonstration. So would you like to tell us just briefly where you are and get that 
demonstration started at this point? Sure. So um, one of the things that really interests me as, um, as a conservator is ink. Um, the most common ink of the 18th century was iron gall ink, which is made by taking copperus or uh, iron sulfate and combining it with tannic acid, which in the period was made from oak galls. Um, and when you combine them together, you get a chemical reaction that creates this really nice black ink. Hmm. And this is I, ink uh, that I'm- I was just gonna ask, an oak gall is like a, is it like a part of the tree? Yeah, so what happens when a gall wasp lays its egg in uh, a tree, and you, you've probably seen them, if you've ever been out walking in the woods in North America and you've seen these puff balls, Oh. Uh, these are actually galls from white oaks. Um, and in the 18th century, people would use these, but they only contain about 10 to 20 percent um, tannins, as opposed to these galls, which are actually imported from the Middle East. They're called galls of Aleppo. And so they are a solid nut, uh, unlike these hollow crunchy balls that are really fun to step on. And so these contain about 50 to 60 percent tannins. So they're a lot more potent. Um, when you were making ink in the 18th century, you would take all of these raw materials and you would crush them up, which I'm not going to do on camera because it's very noisy, but you end up with a fine white powder. And this was sold um, to people who were on the go. You could just buy a powdered ink. And when you add water to it, it becomes black. And so the demonstration that I'm going to get started is turning, is taking our powder and turning it into ink. And it takes a little bit of time for the particles, for the chemical reaction to happen. So if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna move my camera around. Hopefully, there we go, all right. So can we see that? Sorry for the so-so, that's very bright, um, for the so-so <laughs> setup. So we'll get that set up. And so this recipe um, has, in addition to the um, pounded up uh, galls and iron sulfate, it's also got um, gum Arabic. And this is the whole granulated form. This is how it would have been sold in the 18th century. If you purchase it in the modern day for use in watercolors, it comes in this really nice, fine, evenly granulated powder um, that's more consistent. So we're gonna get started and I'm going to take a nice spoonful of the powder. I've got some water and add a little bit more water. That is too much. Okay. Add the powder and then start stirring. Hmm. Hmm. You can see that it's starting to turn black. It is, that's amazing. And I'm gonna let I'm gonna let this sit next to me as we continue talking because it's going to continue to darken as the chemical reaction between the iron and the tannic acid continues. Um, one of the reasons why gall inks, like if you've looked at an old document and it turns brown, hmm. one of the reasons why gall inks will turn brown is because any iron ions in this ink that are just left unbound in the paper after it dries, over time they will react with water in the atmosphere or water in the paper. And when you have water that reacts with iron, you get rust. And so that is um, the oxidation reaction is part of what's helping your ink turn brown and brittle. And sometimes it can really just completely shatter the page. So now we have our, from our white powder wow. to our black ink. That's incredible. And Ben, I noticed you weren't necessarily measuring precise amounts. So is this mostly done by eye and experience with what the texture and the mixture should be like? It is done by eye. Uh, one of the most common mistakes that you can make is to add too much water and then you are left with a unusable slush that you have to keep on 
Adam one or two. Um, one of, of course, one of, one of the challenges about this and like why you have to keep on adding uh, by I is because over time, the potency of the chemicals decreases. Hmm. And so you might end up with something that started off, um, you know, really potent, but then over time you discover that, you know, your, the iron has started to, the iron in your powder has started to interact with the water in the atmosphere. And so it doesn't bond as readily with the water in the solution that you're making. Um, and uh, one of the things that's also really hard is, you know, tannic acids in galls also degrade over time. So the galls that you bought five years ago might have been really potent at the time, but five years later, they're starting to lose their efficacy. Mm -hmm. And this is something that um, one of the reasons why modern gall ink producers uh, just use modern, um, modern standardized tannic acid solutions and modern powdered gum Arabic is because you have the ability to get a more standard solution. And part of the science and at the craft of being a stationer in the 18th century or really being any tradesman was working with ingredients that could vary wildly in how uh, effic efficacious they were. Uh, iron sulfate uh, came in, you know, it was mined from the ground and you could get something that was extremely poor or some uh, pure or something that was extremely diluted. And you, um, you know, if you started adding that chemical to whatever dye bath or ink that you're making, you could make something that was a complete dud, even though it's the same recipe that you've used again and again. That's really interesting to imagine a world uh, in many ways of pre-industrial ingredients and variances and natural materials. Well, while we let the the ink um, steep, I would imagine people are are their appetite is wet at this point for. Um, the work of a stationer, and this is actually, unlike some of the trades we've talked about, it's not even really a word we use that often. There aren't people who are stationers today. So could you give us the big picture of what, it, what did a stationer do in the 18th century? And, uh, you know, we've already maybe unpacked this a little bit, but are there things that you're, you have to be creative about recreating because of a material difference from what we have today? How do you operate as a stationer today? So stationers um, by the 18th century had evolved from the 17th century of someone who largely sold books uh, into people who sold all sorts of things associated with books, learning, paper, um, reading. So a lot of stationers trade cards and newspaper advertisements of the 18th century will refer to them selling what we would think of as stationary products like, um, you know, like writing paper and ink and quills and pencils, but they also sold some things like you might see in the checkout, um, you know, as you're, as you're checking out and there's like all of the last minute grab me's. So they sold things uh, like eyeglasses. Huh. And um, because they sold a lot of uh, books, you know, for instance, they would sell music books, but they would also sell parchment for drum heads and musical instruments. Um, they would also sell playing cards. Um, some of this has to do with the role that stationers had in England of selling goods that had been stamped. Mm. Um, so, you know, you would make sure that if you're going to be paying the duties for all of these stamped goods, not the duties, but if you're going to have all of these stamped goods anyway, you might as well just, you know, sell all sorts of things that would be stamped. Um, and, but they also sold things like pocketbooks, letter cases, um, and uh, stationers will even get into just selling, um, anything that they might have had come around. So a lot of them will just advertise at the end of, at the end of their ads, they'll also have just, you know, like, and uh, I'm selling a few grosses of port wine because, because I had it. Um, and for me, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in focusing on is the thing that tends to show up right in the middle of their advertisements, which is that they advertise selling ink, um, quills, and wax and wafers. And so as I'd already talked a little bit about ink, um, and at the time it was um, a relatively international commodity. So I'd mentioned that, you know, copperus was mined in England. It was also mined on the continent. Galls were often the best quality galls were imported from the Middle East. 
gum arabic is from africa and so something that stationers would be doing is they would be compounding their own inks and selling them either in powdered form or in bottled form often with a deposit for the bottle and so if you were living in a small town and you wanted ink you could go to a stationer you could buy it there are also a lot of recipes for making it yourself in which case you might end up going to a stationer to buy some of the raw ingredients um, another thing that stationers sell that I'm really interested in is quill pens. Hmm. Um, you've all seen them. And if you've ever tried to buy one from a gift shop and it didn't work, it's not because you're bad at writing, it's because they're really not meant for that. Um, but stationers would generally offer ready money to housewives. Um, so if you collected your quill, uh, the quills that your goose would drop, mm. you could bring them into a stationer and sell them on credit. Uh, stationers also, uh, for instance, um, William Trickett, who is a Philadelphia stationer in the late 1770s, he advertised ready money for linen rags, mm. which meant that he had a relationship with a paper maker for being able to sell back uh, linen rags. Um, paper at the time was made entirely of repurposed uh, cellulose fiber rags, so mostly linen and hemp and some cotton. And this is an example of some handmade paper. And if I get up close up, you can see that it's pretty, it's pretty toothy. It's got a nice feel to it. It's got this fine deckled edge from having been made in a mold. And this was made by Timothy Barrett at the University of Iowa. And one of the challenges of you know, working making reproductions is trying to find something that, that looks like this, that has this depth. And this is what you can buy from a store. It's, you know, it has, if you hold it up to the light, it has the chain line texture, but it's very smooth. And it feels really different just compared to 18th century text, um, actual 18th century paper. And one of the challenges for working as a stationer and doing reproduction documents for people uh, is trying to find, you know, depending on a client's budget, trying to find uh, either a machine made paper or if they have the money to buy a handmade paper that's going to work the best for the client's needs. Another thing that stationers sell a lot of is they sell cardboard, which, you know, it's it's called just pasteboard in the 18th century, but also cardboard. So selling thicker boards that you would use for all sorts of industrial purposes, for making boxes, um, for being able to line things. You know, people would substitute board for wood sometimes. Uh, you would also put it into different parts of hats and clothes. Um, you, could, you would use it, of course, for making cheap books instead of using wooden boards. And so not a lot of people, uh, there's actually only one company that makes, um, you know, this handmade paper case board. Um, occasionally you can find it um, from a hand paper maker. So I have some nice stuff here. But part of being a modern stationer is trying to find the best materials, you know, the best substitutes for materials that don't exist anymore. So William Aikman, who's a stationer in Annapolis in uh, the early 1770s, advertises in 1773 that he sells all of these different types of paper. Royal, medium, demi, treasury post, thin post, super fine and common fool's cap, super fine and common pot writing papers, morning and plain quarto letter paper, and cut and uncut writing paper. And so when we, it's one of those things where when you look at the scope of what reenactors or what museum reproductions will use from what existed in the period, just the great varieties of paper that existed compared to what people have access to now, it's something that's a lot smaller. We've lost that vocabulary and trying to, to reproduce those things can be really hard because there's so few options, particularly as a lot of the traditional paper mills just shut down. I think it's amazing um, that variety of paper. Uh, you know, most of us, when we think paper, it, it comes out of a you know, a ream that we put into a printer and it's always white. Um, maybe we play with construction paper as a kid or maybe there's, um, you know, resume paper, but we, you're right. We do have, at least in popular consciousness, a much narrower definition of that. Uh, that's really fascinating. I don't know if our yeah. ink is ready, but I know that you were going to kind of take us through a few of the steps, you know, you talk about quills and sealing of 
actually assembling a letter in the 18th century? Is that, do um, you think we're ready to give that a look? Yeah, we should be ready to give that a look. It's a little bit soupy, but should work up. So while I'm stirring this a little, I'll mention that one of the other challenges that I face as a stationer is trying to sell goods in 18th century style packaging. Mm. And that can be really tricky because a lot of it, you know, that was very ephemeral stuff that doesn't necessarily survive. And so when you're talking about, and how did people ship ceiling wafers uh, if they were made in England? How were, how were they shipped? How were they sold to the consumer? Um, how were, how was ceiling wax made? How were all of these different things? Were they packed into barrels? What were they used? And one of the things that I use is I work with a fiber maker who actually processes flax. And one of the byproducts of flax production is tow. And this was used as a packing material for a lot of the 18th century. And so when I have goods that I know were sold in small boxes, one of the things that I will do with them is to make sure that they survive shipping is that I will actually pack them huh. in tow, which, you know, is biodegradable and you can throw it into your compost heap. So um, tow is like part of the flax plant that they don't use to make uh, finer linen fabric. So it's, I guess it's, um, I don't know, it kind of feels like a fluffy bunch of grass. Is that a fair kind of textural description of it? Yeah, like a very fine, fluffy grass. Um, flax, linen has this nice long staple and when you're cleaning it to get these really long threads out, you end up with a lot of short stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's called the toe. And it's used, it's a byproduct that's used in all sorts of things in the 18th century. So you use it for stuffing furniture, you use it for um, packing material. In paper making, you use it to fill out cheaper grades of paper. So if you're looking at really low quality binders board, it's gonna have a lot of just raw, unprocessed flax in it, as opposed to a writing paper that's gonna be made entirely out of processed worn out linen rags. And um, so it's something that we don't think of the byproducts of the linen industry today, but it's a huge part of a lot of the products that I use as a stationer. And so trying to have a ready access to it is, is pretty hard. So we've got, we've got our ink and I've got a piece of paper. So this is um, when uh, William Trickett was advertising for full scat paper and post paper. He's talking about paper about this size. And so this is this is the size of a piece of paper that's been made in a mold. Yeah. And when you fold it in half, you actually end up with something that's pretty similar to modern letter sized paper. And so if you bought paper of this size, you could take it home, you could tear it in half. And then you would have something that would be about modern writing paper size. For a lot of people, envelopes hadn't been invented yet. And they were, the gummed envelope was invented in the 1850s. So when you were writing a letter, you wouldn't go to a stationer and buy writing paper with a matching envelope set. You would just buy writing paper. And it was your responsibility to fold it up and seal it. And there were two different options that you could use for sealing your letter in the 18th century. You could either use sealing wax, um, and this does not have a wick in it. It is made out of shellac and beeswax and a colored pigment, which at the time, the most popular colored uh, red pigment was vermilion, which is mercury based. And so this is a really hard wax. It burns at a much higher temp or it melts at a much higher temperature than the modern plastic stuff. So if you get it on your skin, it's excruciatingly painful. Um, this was pretty expensive. So in 1775, two sticks of this cost two shillings. Um, and that would be enough to seal about a hundred letters. Um, but on the other hand, you could use the aforementioned wafer seals. And so several hundred of these cost one shilling. So they're about half the price. And I know it's hard to see with my camera, but these are made out of gum Arabic, flour, water, and a pigment. And uh, in the time period, this was usually red lead for cheap wafers or vermilion uh, for uh, the best wafers. One of the challenges as a, as a modern stationer is not using toxic compounds. Mm -hmm. And so I use modern and uh, modern red earth-based pigment, which doesn't give quite the same color, but it has the benefit of not poisoning myself or my customers. Okay. Um, 
And these were very common in the period. People use them not only for sealing letters, but if you tore a letter um, or if you tore something, you would basically use it as tape to stick them back together. This is something that I see a lot as a conservator is documents that have been torn and stuck back together and you have to work around these seals to try and see if there's unique text that's covered underneath. Um, uh, another thing that people use them for is as basically as paper clips. So if you have a lot of attachments that you want to stick to a document, you can use these to attach it. Um, and also for attaching printed seals or embossed seals, you can use these to attach it to the paper. And of course you can use it for sealing a letter. There's an etiquette around um, sending letters, whether you're going to seal them with wax or with, uh, with a wafer, if you're sending it to someone that is your social superior. So if you wanted to submit a petition to Congress that you want to be the official printer of the US Congress, uh, then you definitely wanna seal that letter with sealing wax. So you have to pay the premium. But if you're sending a note to a friend that you would consider your equal or your inferior, you can use a <laughs> wafer. So if you're going to a stationer in the 18th century and you need to send the letter, you have to think about what sort of paper am I going to buy? What sort of sealing methods am I going to buy? And as someone who you know, reproduces these, these are also the considerations that I have to think about when I'm approaching the materials or when I'm approaching making a reproduction document. So let's see if we can get this to work. Still pretty liquidy. So a lot of a lot of 18th century recipes for using ink will say that you want to keep it in the corner of your fireplace for two weeks to darken, oh, wow. and. Um, people complain, um, people complain very regularly about ink powders, not about them being gray. And we are going to demonstrate why people in the 18th century made that exact complaint because it's still true. <laughs> it hasn't fully, uh, hasn't fully <laughs> I'll narrate that we're looking at your hand with the quill in it and the quill has been sharpened to a point and it sort of holds a, a set amount of ink. Some folks may be familiar even with fountain pens or um, sort of a similar point and you're re-dipping it occasionally to, to recharge it with ink as you're writing. And I imagine that's something you would have to do uh, every, every few words if you were working with ink that was the right consistency. Um, typically, if you have a well-cut pen and you have a um, an ink that isn't just falling out of the pen, um, which this is, then uh, you would actually usually be able to write um, a line without redipping, mm -hmm. because if, especially if you're writing small. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see, I'm going to show that um, the ink's really liquid, and so I'm running into the issue of it just falling straight oh. out of the pen. But, but it's definitely legible. I mean, we're seeing your servant in what we would kind of call a cursive script. Yeah. So now that I've written this, uh, if you if you look, I don't know if you can see it, but there's still a lot of hmm. um, liquid on the surface of the page. And so if you've heard about using pounce, this is another thing that you would purchase from a station or if you don't want to just sit and wait for your ink to dry, you can use pounce, which is an absorbative material made out of ground up cuttlefish bones or soapstone or gum sandarac, which is why people call it sanding their paper. It's not because oh. they're using sand, but because they're using gum sandarac. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Um, I've always seen those. You're sort of using what almost looks like a big salt shaker. Uh, and I've heard them called yeah. sanders, but I, yeah, I always assumed it was just sand, not an actual product. Yeah, and so sanders and inkwells are other things that a lot of stationers advertise um, for selling. And this is a reproduction made by Ward. No, not by Ward. It's uh, made by, um, I feel really bad for not remembering his name, um, Goose Bay Workshops. Oh, sure. Um, so now that we've gotten our paper dry, 
Remember that there's no envelopes at the time. And so one of the easiest ways to just fold up a letter is probably very similar to what we did, what you did in high, in elementary school if you sent notes, is you just fold it into its own nice little packet. And one of the things that's really neat about working with original letters as a conservator is that you can often see from the way that the pages were folded, uh, you can often see how they were folded and folded initially. Uh -huh. And so you end up with this nice, tight, little packet hmm. like this. That. Yeah. And so it you all would- the in And it kind of folded it into itself. So it's almost um, holding itself together through those folds. That's cool. So the writing of the letter for most part would be inside. And now what we're seeing is Ben addressing it, I guess you're saying you're writing on the outside it's of the self envelope. Attempting to address it, but it's not going very well because the ink is still very thin. Um, actually, I have an idea. I'm going to use an ink that I've already prepared so that we can see the difference oh, cool. and what the colonial consumer might have thought about the difference between using um, an ink powder and using a liquid ink. So this is some ink that I've had fermenting for a while. It's got a nice, a nice strong smell mm -hmm. to it. And actually looks pretty similar so the top one is the the original or is the top one the one you just did the top one uh which is really blurry is mm -hmm. the ink that i just made Got it. which so because it had one mm -hmm. so yeah it hasn't had time for all of the particles to become completely uh to be um, put in solution so most of them are still sitting at the bottom mm -hmm. of the liquid so now that i have written this going to sand it again. Um, one advice that a lot of ink making manuals give or recipes for making ink is to add some brandy hmm. or some red wine to it to keep it from molding huh. or from freezing in your ink well. Um, and if you, if you think about how cold colonial houses could be um, in the winter, that's that's just not something that we have to think about is worrying about, you know, our, our ink freezing in the inkwell. So you've probably seen, you know, in a movie, um, someone sealing a letter and they've got, you know, this big wafer seal and they dramatically drip all of this wax and they have this big seal and they punch in, it's really fancy and it looks really cool. Um, and that's um, not how wafer seals work. They're not nearly as exciting. <laughs> so when you're talking about using a wafer seal, uh, you, can, uh, you can put them, you'll get this, you'll get this wet so the, the gum Arabic becomes gummy. Mm. And then you can you put it underneath here and you're going to press it with a hobnail seal if you happen to have one. Or if you don't have one, you can just use a pin. And one of the things that's neat to look at when you're looking at surviving wafing, wafer seals is sometimes you can see that it was someone used an actual little pin to prick it individually as opposed to having a hot nail wafer. Hmm. So where did my... So that either that hobnail seal or the pin would create a bunch of little pressure points that would force the, the wafer seal to kind of connect with the two layers of paper, is that? what we're imagining. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to get this a little bit wet. And then you just take the wafer seal and you slide it under the paper and you use hobnail seal to crunch it in place. And you end up with yeah. a little pattern. Uh -huh. And as a conservator, um, or as someone who's working as a historian looking at the material culture of creating a document, um, when you're looking at, at a letter, how it was sealed, 
how big the paper it was that it was used to be written on, the quality of the ink, um, the quality of the person's handwriting, um, and how physically how large the actual sheet of paper was. These are all important clues that go into being able to evaluate the context of the letter that it was created. And it can give you clues about the relationship between the writer and the sender. And when you receive that and you crack it open and you get that nice surviving paper seal. Um, and another thing that's really neat when you're looking at letters is a lot of people in the time period, if you were someone like John Adams who needs to organize a vast correspondence, um, one of the things that you do for organizing your papers is that you refold them after you receive them. And at the top, you write a brief summary of where the letter, you know, where the letter came from, uh, when it was sent, and a brief summary of the contents. And you stack all of these papers up and you tie them in bundles so that you can rip through them and look at them and you can store them in a pigeonhole or you can store them in a box. Um, and when you're, when you're working with um, original documents, this is part of the puzzle that you can see when you have a document that you can, as you unfold it, you see all of the different lines of the folding and the refolding and the letters and the seals and the wear and tear over the years. Um, and as a conservator, these are part of the things that you have to evaluate when you're working with the document. And then as a stationer, these are the details that you want to get correct when you're working with making reproduction materials. Ben, this has been an amazing glimpse into the work of the 18th century stationer. I mean, we've got our letter signed and sealed and I guess the next step would be delivering it but I know I will never look at the letters and the books in our collection the same way again I think this has just been an amazing glimpse into the detail and the the secret messages that are embedded in those objects so thank you again for this great field trip yeah thanks for stopping by um, my workshop isn't much to speak of unlike some of the other people you've worked with um, i have a table set up in my basement and a lot of the work that i do is in my modern kitchen so if you were a stationer in the 18th century a lot of the things you were compounding you might be doing in a period kitchen um, wafer seals were made by uh, mixing up a batter and pouring them into you know uh, iron and then having a lid that you would put on top of or using a hinged press and i just use a modern cast iron pan and a, a panini a cast iron panini top <laughs> um uh, so that part of it isn't necessarily exciting but it's really fun to get to work with the materials and one of the things that brings me a lot of pleasure is being able to take the work i do as a conservator and the work that i do with living history and bring all of that knowledge together that's excellent. Well, thanks again and good luck with that panini press and all the letter writing and paperwork you have to come. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk.